to the last day of this school. Um, so today, uh, just a few announcements that uh, uh, we already uh, made yesterday. So today, there will be no formal Q&A session. Chiara Caprini will uh, lecture at 2 p.m. Uh, so it's not the usual time. So she'll take the time of the usual Q&A session. And uh, the, the usual time of Chiara Caprini's lectures from 11.30 to 12.30 will be free. So you can work on the problems, you can uh, work on dragons, uh, codes, uh, so we have free time. So without further ado, uh, Pedro Ferreira will give his uh, last lecture uh, today. So Pedro, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So um, let me share screen. and get the fancy pointer. Okay. All right, so um, the focus of the last couple of lectures has been on using large scale structure and galaxies to constrain cosmological dark energy or cosmological modification, modifications to Lambda CDM on cosmological scales. I'm now going to talk about a quite a new field uh, which is, can we use gravitational waves? And I'm not going to use gravitational waves in the way that most people use gravitational waves to do cosmology, which is, um, well, until recently had to do with the stochastic gravitational wave background. More recently, people have started talking about measuring H0 with gravitational waves. I'm going to talk about something a bit different, and I, will, I hope you will understand what I mean as we move along. And I'm going to do this solidly in the context of scalar tensor theories. So let me just remind you: in scalar tensor theories, we 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 have we how how did we how did we extend how did we go beyond lambda CDM? We act, added in an extra degree of freedom, a phi field, which is non-minimally coupled to the metric. And you we we discussed a general action, Horn-Dusky and beyond, which has terms like this. We, you know you have a standard kinetic term. You, have, you can have a potential term, but you can have non-mineral couplings to R. You can have couplings between the Einstein tensor and gradients of phi. And you have box phi times, times polynomials in, in, in Delphi squared and other things. And you know, we know how to do this. We know how to build the general action. Um, now, in, in the last few lectures, I really focused on large scale structure. What that means is that I focus on how the scalar sector of this theory behaves. And by the scalar sector, I mean not only the dynamics of the scalar field, but scalar perturbations uh, in the metric and the density in, in everything. Okay. And I argued that um, in that context, what we're looking at is at fifth forces. And what we have then is we have a scalar field, which we expand around a background and it has a perturbation. And this perturbation obeys a massive Klein-Gordon equation in the quasi-static limit. It, it obeys an equation that looks like this, Laplacian squared del phi plus a mass term proportional to rho. And you solve this and you get a, a screening fifth force. And then you plug that into everything else and you look at, for example, density perturbations. And if you remember, I spoke about the growth rate, this F, which is the logarithmic derivative of the density contrast with the scale factor. And that thing is going to be, it's, it's going to have an evolution. And that evolution, it depends on these parameters, mu and gamma, which depend on phi. So this is all if we, we worry about scalar fluctuations in our theory. But we could also worry about tensor fluctuations. And by tensor fluctuations, I mean spin two traceless transverse uh, fluctuations. And so from, from Chiara Caprini's course, you, you've already learned this, right? We, in that case, we're solving the, the box H equation equals zero. And in an expanding universe, in general relativity, it looks like this, where A, well, prime is the derivative with regards to conformal time. This curly H is the derivative of the scale factor with regards to conformal time over A. It's the conformal Hubble constant. A can be plus or, or, plus or cross. It's, it has to do with the polarization state. Okay, And that's the equation it satisfies. Now, in scalar tensor theories, this equation is modified. And it there are two things that happen. You get a, a modification to this term. So in, uh, uh, you get that this 2 becomes a 2 plus the alpha m, which is that one of the Hondesky parameters that I told you about. This is the Hondesky parameter related to the time-varying Planck mass. 
and alpha T, which is specifically related to tensor perturbations. So these come from your Horndesky action. These two parameters come from your Horndesky action. And your modified um, a, a gravitational wave equation looks like this. Okay. Now, this modification has consequences. So for example, if we worry about this alpha m here, what does that mean? That means that if we, we think of this gravitational wave as some wave with some, you can calculate the luminosity of this wave. And if you can calculate the luminosity, you can calculate the luminosity distance. And what you find is that the gravitational wave luminosity distance is like is the light like luminosity distance, but then it has a modification. It has a damping term, which is proportional to the exponential of uh, exponential minus one half integral over logarithm of A of alpha M. OK, so the alpha M, this thing here, because it boosts this thing here, increases this this dissipation term, it damps. OK. So if in any way we can measure the luminosity distance and the gravitational wave distance and see if they're different, we can put a, a constraint on alpha m. What I'm going to focus on is something more dramatic, which is this alpha t. This alpha t, t what is it doing? It's changing the k squared term. This here is basically the gravitational wave speed. In other words, if I were to put units back in, what this is telling me is that the speed of gravitational wave squared is equal to the speed of light times one plus alpha t. It modifies the speed of gravitational waves by, by a certain amount. Now, this is really important because of what happened a few years ago. A few years ago, um, we detected an in, inspiring, uh, uh, um, a binary neutron star that inspiraled, coalesced, and set off a burst of gravitational waves. And we were able to measure it with, uh, with the extended ground-based network LIGO-Virgo, but we were also able to, ex to, to, to measure it using um, electromagnetic wave detectors like Fermi or Integral. And it was, it was, we also were able to detect it in the radio. We were able to detect it in multiple wavelengths. So we were able to detect a burst of gravitational waves coming from a distant source, both in gravity, sorry, we were able to detect an object emitting burst of gravitational waves with LIGO and a burst of light with these other instruments. So we could study how fast these, these, these um, both gravitational waves and light could propagate um, uh, as, it, as they move from that distant object towards us. And what we found was very interesting. The thing that we found is that the, the, time, the difference in the time of arrival between the gravitational waves and the light was not more than 1.7 seconds, a couple of seconds, okay? We were able to measure that we know the distance to the event, which is about 40 megaparsecs, okay? And so we can just do some simple maths. We, can, we know that the distance traveled is gonna be the speed times the time elapsed, and the distance travel in, in gravitational waves is gonna be the distance is equal to the speed of gravitational waves times the time elapsing that we measured with the gravitational wave detector. And the distance uh, in light is gonna be the speed of light times the, the time elapsed for that, okay? And we also know from the previous transparency that we can take the speed of gravitational waves in Horndesky theory is C times the square root of one plus alpha T. So it's C over one plus one half alpha T, okay? So there's a difference between these two things, all right? So now let's do the following. Let's take D over C and D over C, uh, um, C gravitational waves, all right? And we know that that's T over gravitational waves minus, minus T over light, and that's this in less than a few seconds. And then we can plug these expressions. We've got the, we, we know the D, it's the 40, it can go here. We know what C is, we put it in here. We know what C gravitational waves is, and it's just this. And we can Taylor expand. And what we find is a remarkable constraint on alpha T. We find that alpha T uh, can't be greater than of order 10 to the minus 15, which is phenomenal. So basically we, what we show here is that the speed of gravitational waves is essentially the same as the speed of, of light, okay? It's an incredibly tight constraint. Now, what does this mean? And I'm only gonna focus on scalar tensor theories. What this means is that there are certain bits of the Horndesky action which are allowed and certain bits which aren't allowed. So bits that go like this, root, uh, square root of minus g, del phi squared or square, square root of minus g times a potential or f of phi times r, they're allowed because if you work out what the, the alpha t is, it's equal to zero. But terms like this, so f of x, where x is, um, is the kinetic, is the, 
del phi squared times r, or contractions between the Einstein tensor and gradients of phi, or certain terms with box phi contracted with polynomials in phi, these give you non-zero, uh, these give you non-zero alpha t's, okay? So alpha, so the, 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 the stellar field is only allowed to have certain couplings. And the way to think about this is that del phi, you know, partial phi works as a medium in which the gravitational waves are propagating. Let's look at a simple example. Consider this toy theory. Consider this theory where we have a function of x, which is one half del phi squared, times r over two. That's that's the simple one of the simplest exa interesting examples we can cook up with. Cook, cook up, okay? We can work out alpha t, and alpha t looks like this. This is if you have a del m squared del d log um, x m squared minus this bit here, okay? Now we can see that this is going to be zero in two situations. We can be zero if m doesn't depend on x, okay? So if m is x independent, it's not a problem. And so in that case, we can say that the gravitational waves don't couple to the medium. They can also be zero if this is much larger than that. And what that really translates into is that the scalar field is completely subdominant at the cosmological level. In other words, the universe is almost in a, 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 apart from all the other terms, all the other components of the universe. With regards to the scalar field, the scalar it's almost in a vacuum. The scalar field does not constitute a, a, a substantial medium in which the gravitational waves propagate. So this is important. You either have no coupling, or the amount of scalar field is negligible. Okay. So now we look at Horndesky, and I'm just going to write out Horndesky. It's a mess, but uh, let me remind you, it was the sum of five terms, which are functions of phi, x, box phi, and g. You had you had a, a term which was a, just a function of x and phi. You have a uh, you have a term with a box here. You get the Einstein, the modified Einstein-Hilbert term here. You have a term here with the with the Einstein tensor, and all this jumble over here. Okay, and um, that's the uh, on Tondesky action. If you apply the constraint from GW170817, it's remarkable. This, it reduces to this. You're only allowed this kind of coupling to phi here. You're allow, allowed what we call G2, which is K of phi um, and, and X. And then we're allowed um, this, this coupling, uh, a coupling to box phi of this form. And that's it, that's all you're allowed. It, you dramatically have reduced your fu functional space to one with these three functions, okay? So this is, you know, this, is a, this was a game changer in, in studying these theories. It really dramatically reduced the space of allowed theories that we're allowed to look at. Now, there's a caveat here. And the caveat is, well, let me just say, what, what does that mean? There are examples. So let, let's just look at some examples of acceptable theories. Our beloved Jordan Brands Dickey theory is still allowed. You have phi r here. You have here um, kin uh, um, the kinetic term, and you can actually make that the, the coupling that we considered a constant. We can extend it and make it a function of phi. That's allowed and be a phi. The cubic Galilean is allowed, and I've mentioned the cubic Galilean when we were talking about screening. It just looks like a minimally coupled scalar field plus this strange coupling here. The shift, shift symmetric model that I mentioned before, where we now have a function of x and then a coupling of box phi to g of x is also allowed. Um, so these, these theories are, uh, are allowed, and, and there are more subcases that are allowed, but it's still a much reduced set of cases as compared to the original Horndesky action. But the caveats are that the, 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 the of, of this constraint is that the, the field has con to contribute a cosmologically significant amount. The, the, the circular field has to have cosmo cosmological relevance. And I always write it in this way, which is that the critical energy density in some way has to be of order one, i.e. has to be comparable to the other critical energy densities that we consider today. Now, there are some, there are some caveats. There are ways of evading this. And there are people have come up with quite contrived counterexamples. But for example, if you, if you go to the degenerate higher derivative theories, the dosts that we've mentioned here, um, but we haven't looked into, and I'm not gonna look into, you can, some of these, um, you can construct theories that evade these constraints. There's another aspect, which is this constraint is done in a certain regime. But when you apply this to cosmology, you're looking at, at a, a different regime of, of en uh, an, an energy scale. And so you might argue that the effective, any effective field theory approach that you apply in one regime is not valid in the other regime. And these are all valid crit criticisms and people have been looking at in detail. But I think in general, it is true that we've severely restricted scalar tensor theories dramatically with this constraint. 
Now, the question you can ask is how can, can we go further with gravitational waves? Can we look at a, a data set like this and do more and place constraints on these deviations? Okay. In other words, can we use gravitational collapse events like black hole formation, black hole mergers, neutron star mergers, or even exotica to place constraints on, uh, 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 on these deviations from gravity? And to do this, I'm going to first talk about an interesting aspect of, of um, that's come out of this GW170817, and it's going to set the scene of where we want to go. The first thing is that black holes are fascinating objects because one of the reasons is that in, in general relativity, they obey what are known as no hair theorems, which is under very specific assumptions, black holes are uniquely described in terms of a very few number, a few, a, a, a few very few numbers. They're described in terms of their mass, their spin, and they're described in terms of their charge, but let's forget the charge for now. Um, in other words, if you form a black hole in general relativity, it will always settle down to Kerr-Newman, okay? Now, beyond general relativity, this, does, this is not necessarily the case, and what do I mean by that? If we think about scalar tensor theories, you can imagine that you can form black holes where your scalar field phi has a profile which depends on r away from the fifth from from the black hole and because this phi is in some sense responsible for the fifth force you've got this new gravitational force which is carried by this phi of r not only that but if you look at the the um the metric it won't be Kerr newman or schwarzschild and so in principle it you can have violations of the no hair theorem if you go beyond general relativity now you try doing that and it's not that easy so for example if we look at our you know standard theory jordan brands dickey theory this theory has no hair in other words if you try and solve find black hole solutions the metric looks just like schwarzschild and the, the solution the, the background solution is just phi equal to a constant and this is something we've known for almost well for 50 years now since uh, stephen hawking showed this in, in in the early 70s but you can construct so a lot of theories obey no hair theorems and, and have that problem. Nevertheless, you can construct theories which do have hair. And a, a notable example is suppose that you add to the Brands Dickey action, you uh, add a term like this. You have your phi here, and then you add this specific combination of the Riemann tensor, the Ricci curvature, the Ricci tensor, and the Ricci uh, uh, scalar. This is known as, or this is what is known as the Gauss Bonnet invariant. If you do that, you find that indeed your metric, your black hole metric is modified and you end up with a new term here and more and your scalar field has a radial profile, which is a function of R, R so it's, it has a fifth force. Um, and it depends on the, the scalar charge of whatever object you're looking at, okay? So it is possible to construct theories with hair. Now, what does GW170817 tell us about black hole hair? Well, it tells us the following, and this is an interesting result we found. It's not a proof, but it's just an exhaustive search through black hole sol solutions through the literature. And it is that if the scalar field obeys, uh, it, it, is, it has cosmological significance. In other words, the energy density in the scalar field is comparable to the energy density in the other quantities. Okay, We can apply the GW170817 constraint, and we get this. And there is, uh, there is circumstantial evidence that all black holes in scalar tensor theories have no hair, i.e., but it's a very important if we satisfy this. Now, it turns out that, of course, Einstein, Dilaton, Gauss, Bonnet, the theory that I just mentioned, and Chern Simons um, uh, do have hair, but you do, you cannot have, these theories do not have omega phi of order one. So you, ca you cannot construct cosmologically significant um, solutions to the, these equations. So these are not of interest. The ones that are of our interest are the ones that have cosmological uh, significance. And the, the nature of these lectures are about cosmology. So that's my setting. In higher derivative theories, in dose, you may have hair. And there, has been a t there have been attempts at trying to construct solutions. And I think this is really a work in progress. But I would, I'm just going to say that in generality, black holes will have no hair. And this causes a problem then, because if black holes have no hair, that means there are no fifth forces around them. So we can't test them by measuring PPN parameters, looking at orbits or looking at any effects that arise from, from uh, uh, um, fifth forces. There's gonna be no effects on mergers and gravitational waves. In other words, 
how are we going to look for evidence for this, ex this extra degree of freedom, this five field, this we could call it dark energy by looking at mergers, by, by looking at black holes? Well, I'm gonna go back to what I said at the beginning. I said, I wanna use this of this, something like this to constrain black hole. And let's just break it apart. You've seen this in Chiara's lectures. In, what is this? These are, this is a result of two inspiraling black holes. You'll have an inspiral, you'll have a merger, and then you'll have a ring down, okay? And I'm gonna really focus on the ring down, which is this bit over here. The ring down, how do we how do we study ring down? What is the ring down? The ring down is you form this black hole. This black hole is excited and perturbed, and it's gonna settle down to form the final black hole. And in doing that, it's going to emit gravitational waves. Now these gravitational waves, and if you have um, uh, an extra degree of freedom like phi, have to satisfy specific boundary conditions. You've, you, they, they're created close to the black hole, so they have to propagate outwards, but they also have to fall inside the black hole horizon. So they have these very strange boundary conditions. They have an ingoing boundary condition at the horizon and an outgoing boundary condition at infinity. And a result of this, which is interesting, if you think of the kind of problems you've solved in your mathematics courses, you, you never have boundary conditions like that. You're typically fixing them, or you might fix some derivatives, but you never have these. These are almost like dissipative boundary conditions. You're just getting rid of stuff. And when you're getting rid of stuff, you will, you, 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 as you can imagine, what you're gonna find is that the frequencies of the solutions to this equation are complex. Let me just build on this a little bit more. What do you do? Well, you take your metric and you perturb it around the black hole solution and you have these perturbations. And then you expand these perturbations in e to the i omega t. So this thing is a function of omega and then the spatial coordinate. But we're gonna consider spherical symmetry so it's only a function of r, all right? And then what we do is we're gonna decompose this in a set of spherical basis functions which are either odd or even. Um, are either odd or, 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 or even. The, in odd, we typically call them psi, in even, we, call, we typically call them z, okay? And we plug them into the wave equation. And we do that, when we do this, what we find is that the even modes satisfy an equation that looks like this. So don't forget, we've, we've Fourier transformed, so we've gotten rid of this omega. So it's just a second order equation in, uh, in, um, in R. This is not the usual R, this is a particularly, this is a coordinate change. It's known as the tortoise coordinate. It's not very important. The only thing you need to know is that for in the tortoise coordinate at minus infinity, you have the horizon, and then it maps onto plus infinity, uh, the, the usual coordinate. So minus infinity in the, co in the tortoise coordinate, it goes, to, um, it goes to, the, to the horizon, and plus infinity, it's just like in any of the others. And what is this? This is just like a Schrodinger-like equation. So you get a Schrodinger-like equation with this, with, this, um, with this potential. And this is just a, a cartoon of what that potential is. I've decomposed this in spherical harmonics so that it depends on L. And you see that for L equals two, it looks like this. For L equals three, it looks just like the potentials you play around with, with your salt when you're, you're doing quantum mechanics. Turns out that the odd modes also satisfy an equation like that. It's known as the Reggie Wheeler equation. And here's the Psi, and it looks something like this. So we reduce this. We've reduced this to um, two types of two equations. Well, a type of equation that you know very well how to solve. You know how to solve these equations because you've done this in quantum mechanics, and they have very specific boundary problem, boundary values. They have very specific boundary values in the sense that they, as you go to minus infinity in the R star in the tortoise coordinate, it go, has to go outward. It has to go that way. And as you go to plus infinity, it has to go that way. In other words, it has to be ingoing in the horizon and outgoing at plus infinity. And as I said, that means that there's, it's got to be dissipative. You have, you're going to have to have an exponential decay rate. So there are methods for solving this, and um, there are various numerical methods. There are some analytic methods for solving, to, for finding these discrete um, uh, uh, frequencies. They're known as the quasi-normal mode frequencies. And a very interesting thing happens in um, general relativity, and it's the following, that if you know m, j, and q of the black hole, you can uniquely determine these quasi-normal mode frequencies. And this is a, a plot of exactly that. A is nothing more than, is, is a, a kind of a dimensionless way of writing J. It's like J over M. Um, but what you have is for a given M uh, and, and the given J, forget Q for now, you will only have very specific tracks lying on here. 
which means if you think about this, if you go away and you measure these quasi-normal mode frequencies, and what are these quasi-normal mode frequencies? These quasi-normal mode frequencies are nothing more than some kind of decomposition, um, uh, uh, wave decomposition of this part, of this part. So you, you take this, you transform it, and you find at where, what frequencies are contained in this, and these are the quasi-normal mode frequencies. You measure these quasi-normal mode frequencies, and if you know two quasi-normal mode frequencies, you know all the others, because they're all determined in terms of M and J. So if you determine two quasi-normal mode frequencies, you have M and J, you can work out all the other quasi-normal mode frequencies. Which is a beautiful test because if you can calculate these two quasi normal, measure these two quasi normal mode frequencies and then predict all the others, you can then go away and try and measure the others and see if they lie exactly where they should lie given these constraints. Okay, so it's a beautiful test for the no hair theorem. But now with, with scalar tensor theories, something very interesting happens. So, as I said, um, in scalar tensor theories, in generality, in gen generality, settle down to a um, uh, uh, no hair, which means Schwarzschild or Kerr, all right? So a GR black hole. So you might expect that the quasi-normal mode frequencies, even in scalar tensor theory, are gonna be just like the GR, GR um, uh, quasi-normal mode frequencies. But that's not the case because we have perturbations of the scalar field. So even though the background might be, might, uh, might be a constant, you will still have perturbations in the scalar field. And so how are the equations modified? Well, let's just look at the Zerilli equation. This is the Zerilli equation. And what we have is the normal Zerilli equation. And when it's GR, it's equal to zero. But now it's going to be sourced by fluctuations in the scalar field, which are here, which obey their own type of Zerilli-like equations. In other words, and both of these obey um, the quasi-normal mode boundary conditions. Both are ingoing at the horizon and outgoing at infinity. So you now have to solve this full system and if you remember from your maths, from your what you what would you do first? You would solve this equation equal to zero to get the homogeneous solutions. That's just going to be the GR quasi-normal mode frequencies. Then you're going to solve this, and you're going to get quasi-normal mode frequencies due to the scalar field. And then you're going to feed this into here. And so the quasi-normal mode frequencies from here are going to contaminate the quasi-normal mode frequencies. So you're going to get an extra set of quasi-normal mode frequencies, which are going to appear in your gravitational wave spectrum. So this is the way to look for the presence of the scalar field. Look for the quasi-normal mode frequencies arising from this new degree of freedom. And this is just a, an example of what might, you might do. Imagine that you, you've excited this and you have a certain amplitude in your scalar field and you have a certain amplitude in your gravitational wave. If the amplitude in your scalar field is very small, um, the extra quasi-normal mode frequencies are not, going to, are not going to affect your, your gravitational wave uh, very much. It's going to be indistinguishable from GR. But if your quasi-normal mode frequencies, the amplitude of your scalar field are, is substantial, like here, if the amplitude of your scalar field is sufficiently high, it's really going to distort your ring down. And so you should be able to pick up signatures of the scalar field in the ring down. So the question is, can we pick this up? Can we measure evidence for these scalar modes in, 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 the, in, the, in the ring down? Well, I'm just going to do very quickly a, 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 a go through the de detectability of this. How easily or how well can we detect these extra dark energy modes? Well, let's define some new, put in some useful definitions. This is the this is the gravitational wave. It goes as T as of X, and you can Fourier transform it, and, you, and this is what it looks like. You can define a sig signal to noise where you basically square that H of F, or this is just like a cross spectrum, the kind of thing that Dragon will have shown you, except now this is in the Fourier transform of the time domain, and you divide it by the noise of your instrument. And what does the noise look like? Well, this is the noise of one of the experiments, the LISA experiment that Chiara has told you about. And it'll be low or reasonably low in one region, but then it'll get very high in other regions. So you'll basically have to look at your, your, your gravitational wave signal in a certain range of frequency space, which is over here. Well, suppose you do that. OK, what will you learn? Let's just re revisit our, our um, let's just revisit our um, uh, 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 action which passes the GW170817 constraint. Remember, it was reduced to this. And if we look at the gravitational waves, um, if you remember, the, the, the equations depend on this mass here, an effective mass over here, this effective mass over here. And we can work out what that mass is directly from the action. And it's, it's going to depend on parameters in the action. It's going to depend on the second derivative with regards to phi of this, which it really is the, the, in some sense, the second derivative of the potential. Um, it's going to depend on derivatives with, with regards to x of k. 
Um, it's going to depend on all these different terms, okay? So if you can detect something, you'll be able to say something about all these different components in this combination, okay? And this is what happens if you do that. You can try and forecast what you'll be able to do with Lisa, all right? So let me try and explain this plot to you. Here, what I have is how large is the amplitude of the scalar fluctuations generated um, in, in the ring down? And if it's down here, it's low. Here, if it's comparable to the gravitational wave perturbations, okay? Here, I've got the mass of the black hole that you're looking at divided by the, the, the solar masses, all right? And what I have here, the colors here are the, the how, how small a mass can you detect, okay? And I've multiplied this by the signal to noise, the square root of the signal to noise. Remember the signal to noise was that quantity that I constructed over, over here, okay? So the higher the signal to noise, the higher the signal to noise, the smaller the mass we can detect. And what you find is that if the amplitude of your scalar field of your, your scalar fluctuations is high and your black hole is large, um, you'll be able to, to detect much smaller masses. In other words, you'll be able to de measure this quantity much more precisely than if your black holes are small and the amplitude of your scalar field is small. But this gives you basically, a, a depending on your, your what we'll be able to do with LISA, how well we'll be able to detect, um, well, with LISA, depending on the size of the black holes we measure and what kind of events we're looking at, how well we'll be able to de de um, measure the, 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 that, that, that bit of the, the Horndesky action, okay? So the key point here is this thing here, right? Because if the amplitude of the scalar field generated in these, these events is really low, it's going to, we're not going to get fantastically tight constraints on that thing. But if the amplitude of the scalar field fluctuations is high, um, we might. And so I think this is one of the great challenges of this field is um, how can we, can we figure out what is the amplitude of the scalar field in a number of situations? Now, the assumptions behind, um, you might say that the assumption, in principle, you know, you might think, well, well you're never going to generate this scalar field because you, you start off with two black holes which have no hair and they come together. How are you going to generate the scalar field? But what you've got to remember is that the assumptions behind no hair theorems are very restrictive. They, they assume stationarity and asymptotic flatness. And the real universe is very different. You, 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 we know that there are counterexamples where you break a lot of these, these um, assumptions. You can have that uh, complex scalar fields. You can have topological solutions to scalar fields, which break the symmetries. Um, we know that Horndesky theory with omega phi very not, not close to one, you can do it. So we know there are ways of breaking this. Um, there's one particularly um, uh, 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 popular way that people have been looking at, which is using a quantum process, which is um, a combination of a beautiful relativistic process and a quantum process, which is known as superradiance. And it's an idea of Penrose that if you throw an ingoing par a particle into a, a curved black hole in the right way, it'll come out with a higher energy than it came out. And it'll do that by emitting a particle that falls inside the black, the curved black hole. So this process of kind of speeding up particles or giving energy to particles with, with um, of winding up a system using a curved black hole, you can do it at the quantum mechanical level. And what you're doing there is you have fluctuations in the scalar field. And if they are in, they're coming into the black hole in a certain way, they can be amplified and they can create clouds around the scalar field. I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different, which is accretion. Really simple thing. We know that black holes accrete matter. What happens if they accrete a uh, scalar field? Well, in principle, nothing should happen because of the no hair theorem. But if we think about one very simple case, which is the case of a massive Klein-Gordon field, well, we know what the solution of this asymptotically is. If we solve this, the homogeneous solution to this is we get rid of all spatial dependence. It's just a harmonic oscillator equation. We know that asymptotically, it behaves as cosine m over t, so it, it oscillates. The scalar field asymptotically oscillates. And in fact, this is one of the ways that we, we um, one of the proposals for dark matter, because if you then work out what the energy density does because of the damping, it goes as one over a cube, just like dark matter. So scalar fields, for example, don't satisfy um, the, the, the assumptions behind no hair theorems. They, they are not stationary uh, at infinity. And so the question is how, how, how these, do these scalar fields behave if you put, a, a homogeneous scalar fields behave if you put a black hole in the middle of them? And what you find and what we found is that they accrete and they accrete and they build up around black holes and they form clouds. And they form these clouds, these, these big um, 
big structures around black holes. In other words, they form um, uh, uh, non-trivial solutions of the scalar field, which you can always interpret as um, a, a, an AS, an amplitude in scalar field fluctuations being non-negligible, okay? And these are just plots of showing this happen. I just let's just look at this one. You started off and it's just homogeneous. This is just that line here. And as you, you evolve it, you start forming this one here, the, the orange, and then you evolve it more and you form the green. And over time, it'll populate this curve, which is the stationary solution. So oh, well, well, it's kind of stationary, not exactly stationary, but it, it'll populate that profile. So we know how to generate um, non-trivial profiles of the scalar field in a cosmological setting. But we don't, you know, that's not the only thing we can do. We, we don't we don't only have to focus on black holes, we can focus on neutron stars and black hole, uh, uh, and, and we know that neutron stars will support fifth, fifth forces, as was discussed, I think, in the Q&A a, a, a few days ago. And so when neutron stars merge, they will form a black hole, but there will be a remnant of the scalar field which could generate those quasi-normal modes. The same thing with black holes merge with a neutron star, it'll inherit these fluctuations in the scalar field. Uh, 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 an interesting route to look at is by looking at exotica. We know we're just talking about black holes and neutron stars, but you could look at, for example, stars made of the scalar field, boson stars. What happens when these things collapse and form black holes or when topological defects form black holes? I know that Chiara has mentioned cosmic strings, but I think it's a particularly beautiful example of what you might do. So let's consider here, a uh, uh, let me just remind you what a, a cosmic string is. A cosmic string is you have a complex scalar field, so has a U1 or SO2 symmetry with a potential that satisfies that symmetry. That potential has a max, has a, an unstable minimum, has an unstable stationary point uh, in the middle, and then has a a, a ring around here, which is the true vacuum. And the scalar field will form, uh, will, will form collapse around here. And depending on how it happened, it may be that it'll, it'll lie on different parts of this ring and different parts of the universe. And where it comes together, the field is forced to lie on the top of this potential. And so what you'll have is line-like concentrations, very energetic line-like concentrations of the scalar field. Now, an interesting thing happens if you couple this, these, um, these um, the cosmic strings non-minimally, to uh, the, the, the Ricci scalar. And this is, this is an example of what might happen. You have this cosmic string here and it's collapsing. And as it collapses and it forms a black hole, it'll set off this burst of gravitational waves. And this burst of gravitational waves will, you form the black hole, will just be the usual quasi-normal modes, but it'll also contain a scalar mode because you have this scalar field and this scalar field has to propagate outwards, has to satisfy the quasi-normal mode conditions. And what you'll see in a gravitational wave detector will be a combination of these two things. So you'll have a signal from the scalar field, which will be, uh, in terms of the quasi-normal modes, um, uh, um, which you, you, you might use to constrain your theory. So I'm going to end here because I, you know, we, we want to have a lot of time for questions. Um, I think this is a new field. I think there are various avenues to be explored. I've decided to go down this route, which hasn't been looked at in much detail, which is, can we use gravitational waves to place constraints on theories of dark energy? And it, crucial to this was to understand that, you know, of course you can, GW1708.17 was important. It, li it limits the, the, what theories you know, we, we, we have to look at, but it points us towards where we might look at, and I think we should look at ring down. And so one of the challenges that we have to solve, it's quite a complicated channel, challenge because it mostly involves numerical relativity, but is there any, can we find dynamical sources of the scalar hair which would affect the ring down uh, around black holes? Okay, so I'm going to stop here and I'm going to start taking questions. So let me look at the chat. I've already got three questions in the chat, I think. Very good. So the first question was by Giovanni uh, uh, Francini, and it says, the, the gravitation wave luminosity distance could also result, the result could also be amplified, not only respect, not only doubt. That's absolutely right. If alpha m has the, the, the opposite sign, let me try and share with you again, just to point out what he's saying. Okay, share again. Okay, and so he's talking about this 
Come on. He's talking about this expression here, right? And so you have that DL is exponential minus the half of this. And I was just assuming that this was positive, but it might be negative. You're absolutely right. The time variation might be that you're decreasing the Planck mass as opposed to raising it. So it'll have an effect on the luminosity distance. Okay. Can I ask a follow up on this, Pedro? Yeah. Alpha, yes. alpha, alpha T can also be positive, right? Alpha T can be can go either way. Yes. So you can have a, you could have in principle the speed of gravitational waves larger than the speed of light. Yes, but that's that's you, we know that happens in a medium, right? Right. We know that happens in a medium. You you can play with a medium to do something like that. And but so that you can, can imagine. Not... Well, no, it's not a vacuum because you've got a scale of field. Okay. Right? That's the key point. You have a medium. You've got a scale of field. Um, so you don't violate causality. No. Now we've got uh, Reggie. Three questions. Am I incorrect? Am I correct in interpreting this means a measurement of the gravitational wave luminosity distance will be a constraint on alpha m? Yes, you are correct. Can we, in principle, measure a gravitational wave luminosity distance or a gravitational wave flux? I would suggest you look at the literature because over the last, only over the last year, people have started uh, uh, talking exactly about doing that. Um, for theories with alpha m equals zero, for example, kinetic gravity braiding, what else can we constrain in the ten tensor sector if alpha m equals zero and alpha, P, alpha t equals zero? Nothing. We can't constrain anything. If we can't, you know, if the theory has zero alpha m and zero alpha t, it's not going to be constrained by the gravitational waves. Fine. Uh, Giovanni Francini, would it be interesting to see how gravitational wave backgrounds would get modified in a modified gravity model? Um, I mean, I, I I don't know what to say to this because. I have a view on gravitation, stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds, which is that what Chiara is talking about is potentially detectable, the omega GW. But you, if you think about that, that's not a lot of information. Okay. So, you know, you'll detect it and you'll be able to place constraints on something, but you won't have any information about how that G, G, w, omega GW is made up. So it's a bit like measuring the temperature of the CMB and trying to use that to constraint models. It's just not, you know, it's just, there's just not enough information there to, that would be able to distinguish between a modified gravity model and something else. So that's my, my concern would be that. Um, now, some people would say, but that looking at, at anisotropies in the stochastic gravitational wave background, it would be detectable, but I don't think it is detectable. You know, I've written a paper on, on what, 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 what we expect with the Einstein telescope or the LISA, and I, I just don't think the, the noise properties are low enough to, 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 for it to be detectable. So my view is I don't think it would be possible to, to, to distinguish a modified gravity model with, with the gravitational wave background from anything else. So Zachariah has a question. Zachariah, you have a question? Go ahead, Zachariah. Yeah, so actually I have many questions because I was waiting for the, this lecture from the beginning uh, because I'm very interested. So the first one is very simple. Why in alpha t the, you use partial der derivative for the nominator and uh, total derivative for the term that was uh, near to m squared? And the second one, uh, you said that there will be... Uh, ah, okay, okay. Let's answer each question by question. Um, uh, let me just quickly look at my transparencies. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, spend time sharing. I just wanna be sure what you're saying. I, I meant total derivative. Both of them are total derivative. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, so the second one, it's about uh, that all uh, models uh, that have cosmological relevance uh, respect no hand theorem. So how we can check mathematically this cosmological yeah. relevance? And oh, write, the write the Friedman equation. The simplest thing is just write the ah, Friedman equation. Okay. It's going to be h okay. squared, the normal stuff plus extra stuff. And just look at if the extra stuff is comparable to, 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 to the normal stuff. OK, that's nice. Uh, so 
if we are looking for an, uh, an uh, alternative way of what you are doing, so there is uh, two things that we can do. We can look for other solutions of hairy black holes of some theories that have cosmological relevance, or we can see these models of those that can evade uh, this constraint. So yes. this is the only other alternative solution. That's the only way That's because I said I, do, I don't have a mathematical proof for that um, for what I said I mean it's a paper that we, we wrote but and what we did was we just looked at everything had, uh, everything everything had done you could look for try and find solutions to that theory which have hair but you have to be very careful to check that those solutions are stable because that's one of the problems that people have is they find solutions and then they don't check, check the stability and if those solutions are unstable they're not interesting um, the other thing is to look at dose, and there is work by Sharmusis and others trying to find, and I think they have found solutions in the dose theory. Okay, and these solutions are, uh, have cosmological relevance? Um, I, haven't, I haven't checked that. So the, the only reason I'm, I'm trying not to say too much about it is I, I haven't gone to see if those theories have cosmological relevance. Okay, nice. I have checked, uh, the other... I have, I have checked for Chern Simons and um, Einstein, Dillett, and gauss bonnet but I have not checked for the dose. Okay. Uh, and also uh, about the M, you said that we have more constraint M, but M depend on many parameters. So how can we, uh, using LISA, can we constrain all, uh, par all the parameters of Hrodensky theory using uh, AS and... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. With LISA using ring down, the only thing you can constrain is that combination of parameters, okay? So the, ah. that combination in the action. I mean, it's always like that. When you have an experiment, it'll constrain a few things. And they might not be exactly the terms that you have in the action, but it'll be combinations of things. But that's life. Uh, but how we can correspond to, to a specific model? Well, you can, well, what you can do is it'll have a, that'll be a constraint, and then you, what you see is does your model lie in that constraint or not? For each model, you have a K, you have a, a G3, and you have an F, and you just have to see if it lies in that in, in that um, re the excluded region or not. Okay, and what for the ring down? We we need to use the numerical relativity, but modified code for alternative theories. Yeah, well, to, for two things, I mean, for ring down. It turns out that for calculating quasi-normal mode frequencies, you can do it analytically, or you can use codes. They're not numerical relativity codes. There are various different codes, methods that you can use to solve to find the quasi-normal mode frequencies. To find the amplitudes, those, that thing, that elusive aspect that I was looking at, at the moment, I think the only way to do it properly is with numerical relativity. But it's also true that I, you know, I think people have to be clever. And one of the great things about systems that are difficult numerically is that clever people find clever ways of getting around it. So if you can find a clever way of trying to figure out the amplitude of certain systems without using numerical re relativity, you know, that would be a success. Okay, okay. I'm, the... now getting questions. I'm now getting questions. I think you've had your time, Zakaria. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip your questions, Reggie, because I've already answered a few of your questions. If, I'll, if I have time, I'll go back to you. Um, Andrisha says, could you also comment on how super radiance could be used uh, uh, in constraining scalar tensor theories? I, I, on purpose, I skipped talking about that because I think that's quite an active field. And there's wonderful work by um, Vitor Cardozo, Paolo Pani, Emmanuel Berti on this topic. And I, I strongly recommend, uh, Caio Macedo from Brazil, I, recommend, I strongly recommend you look at some their papers to see what they've done. Okay, what about investigating gravity wave propagation with inhomogeneities, adding perturbations in the universe? There are recent works that consider kind of weak lensing of gravitational waves, linear perturbation of luminosity distance, and strong lensing. Uh, both of them have interesting forecasting. Out. Could you comment on these works? It's an interesting topic. I worked a little bit on this a couple of years ago. I found that it's a bit ambitious to be able to do this. I mean, I think it's already ambitious to use this to put constraints on normal, you know, cosmology and gravity, let alone extensions of, of general relativity. So, um, I mean, I think it's an active field and I think you should have a look at it, but um, 
I, 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 I'd like to understand better how realistic using these constraints are. Uh, having said that, in the 1990s, I said we'd never be able to use um, measure weak lensing in the cosmic microwave background, and so I was very wrong. So, you know, I, <laughs> don't take my word for this. Um, what is the connection? Tibor Dome says, what is the connection between quantum superradius and the black hole Penrose process? How should we best think of the scale of fuel cloud creation process? This is a really good question. I don't think I have time to go into this, but I think it's, it's in the same way that you have an amplification when you send a classical particle in and it decays into two particles and, and, and the particle that comes out has a higher energy. I think you can imagine something like that happening to fluctuations in the scale of fuel. You have an amplification process, but the exact details of how this happens, there's a brilliant book which is on the archive by Cardozo, Brito Cardozo and possibly Pani doing exactly that. And you might want to look at that book that'll give you that a pedagogical introduction to all that. David Gutierrez says, so if I got it right, we can only find evidence for fifth force on black holes if the no hair theorem is violated. Um, and by what you mentioned about the assumptions behind this theorem, is it correct to say that no hair theorem is not quite a right description of the nature of black hole? Uh, both of those are good statements. The first one is, if you have a black hole with hair, the scalar field will have a non-trivial profile. And remember that the force is going to be the gradient of the scalar field. So if you have a black hole with hair, you will have a fifth force. So um, you need to have hair to, to, to be able to, 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 to measure a fifth force around a black hole. Um, the other thing is about the assumption of, assumptions about these theorems. Well, it's an interesting point because the, the assumptions that we have, and I mentioned this yesterday, is that um, the assumptions for no hair theorems are quite restrictive, which is stationarity, asymptotic flatness, but we know that the universe isn't stationary and we know that the universe isn't asymptotically flat. So you might question, okay, then these no hair theorems are not valid. But it turns out that the amount by which the no hair theorems are violated, if you just consider the normal stuff, like accretion of matter around a black hole in Friedman, aren't enough to violate the no hair theorem so that you can see observable hair, okay? So you need more, you need more, you need to violate these assumptions in a more extreme way. And the example of the accreting oscillating scalar field is one such example. Can we speculate that the collapse of cosmic strings produced primordial black holes? Um, I think there are, uh, there are, there have been papers recently on exactly that. I don't know that topic well enough to be able to say anything. So I've done this, I've done the chat questions. I didn't open Slack today. And I don't know if there are any questions in Slack. I can look at Slack to see if there are questions for you. I don't think there are. I don't think there are, no. Right, so now I can go back to Reggie's question and then Zakaria's questions. Uh, Reggie, sorry, last two. Many thanks in advance. One, what about constraining gravitational wave using propagation effects at large distances? But that's exactly what I've done with the with the um, with the speed of gravitational waves, right? Um, so this is a, an example of doing exactly that. What happens to the quasi-normal modes for black hole spins violating the cosmic censorship conjecture? I don't know. I don't know enough about the. I don't know enough about that. Okay. Now, Zakaria, you had another question you wanted to ask me. Ah, yes. Uh, so it's about, uh, you didn't say anything about alpha m. Uh, and I know that we can, there is a possible way, but it's difficult to use screening to, to, uh, to constrain it. So can yeah. you comment on that? And also, you said all the theories, do, do you mean all theories only scalar tensor or even like massive by gravity or uh, other theories f that have no cosmological relevance uh, for uh, and that ha that have hair uh, don't have uh, cosmological relevance. Uh, so the we, so uh, black holes in bi gravity theories and massive gravity theories is very underexplored. There's a very nice paper by Rachel Rosen which shows that actually you can't form stationary black hole solutions, that there's a time dependence in them. So um, you, you have that. With regards to vector tensor, you um, we haven't looked into the vector tensor case. I haven't looked into the vector tensor, so I don't know. 
you, with regards to constraining alpha M with screening, the problem is when you start looking at screening, you're, you're entering a kind of a non-linear regime of the equations of motion, okay? And remember the alpha M appeared in the linear action. So you could, you will be able to indirectly constrain alpha M because you will be constraining the fundamental action. And in the fundamental action, you then know how to derive alpha M. But alpha M does not explicitly enter into the equations for screening. Um, but it, it, in principle, it might be possible. I haven't looked at it. Okay. okay. Then, Raphael Robson Limbusch Santos said, given that tightness constraints for gravitational speed, could we say massive gravity is ruled out? Um, no, because, well, it's an interesting question. I, I, what the places a bound on the mass of the graviton, okay? So it places a bound on certain terms in the ma in massive gravity or or um, or by gravity, but it turns out that the dispersion, I think, the dis the measure of of the gravitational wave dispersion places tighter constraints. But still, no, massive gravity is not ruled out. Okay, Harris Serifos. Since it's the last day of the school, is it possible to account for inflation using theories of modified gravity? Well, there's a very long history of um, there was a lot of inflation model building in the 1980s and uh, 90s. And a lot of these models uh, involve non-minimal couplings between the scalar field and, uh, and the metric. Um, and I'm sure Rougeri remembers these models. You remember supernatural inflation, and you know, there were these hyperextended inflation. There were a lot of mod, you know, so it is definitely possible. I'm sorry, would you please repeat the name of the, David Gutierrez is asking, could you please repeat the name of the theorem you just mentioned about the non-stationarity of black holes? Um, what, do I, I, what, what, um, what did I mention? I'm a bit confused with this question. I think it was about this uh, uh, result of Nathan Rosen, I think you mentioned. No, not Nathan, Rachel Rosen. Oh, I'm sorry, Rachel Rosen's paper. Very Rachel good. Rosen. Yes. yes, good. Look at Rachel Rosen's paper uh, uh, on, on um, black holes in, in massive gravity. Guan Hao Sun has written her name, so you should be able to chase that up. Okay, I don't see any further questions. Ah, wait, there is uh, Renan Boschetti. Renan Boschetti, if someone is interested in testing gravity at cosmological scales, what do you recommend? I mean, what cosmological observables are the most promising in order to test? Well, I, I'm I've just given two lectures on that, right? I mean, if you 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 if you're going to use cosmological scales, you're going to measure the growth rate, and you're going to measure weak lensing. The growth rate comes from large scale structure, so basically you have to do that. You have to. I mean, I I recommend that you read my review paper, which is I put the reference in the lecture notes. It's an, an, an annual review of astronomy and astrophysics, where I go through what are the observables. Uh, excuse me. I have a last question. Yeah, I'm still interested about the topic. Uh, so uh, about AS, we are just having a signal. How can we distinguish if we have like exotic compact object or we have like just a hair around the black hole? You mean, well, um, you mean th that, let me try and understand your question a bit better. Suppose, are you saying that your exotic compact object has formed a black hole or it's it's an exotic compact object? Yeah, yeah. I said, we, like we have a signal with Lisa and how we can detect from this signal if we have a case of an exotic object or uh, a case of uh, a black hole with a strange modified uh, scalar profile. We have to, we have to study the, we have to start study the, the gravitational wave spectrum. We have to, we have to, Run a code and see if they look what they look like, and you know all, the examples that we know they look very different. And I think a key aspect is the black hole has that that ingoing horizon has that ingo ingoing into the horizon, which pins down the the quasi normal mode frequencies to be of a certain type. While, for example, a compact object might have um, you, you can imagine it might have echoes, might have ringing, might have other stuff. But the only way is to actually model it and figure and see what the signal is. I don't think there is a general answer okay. to what you're saying. Okay. Finally, Reggie okay. is saying, is there a, um, what about solving the cosmological constant problem using modified gravity? I have yet to find an acceptable solution to that that would make us happy. 
Okay, so this was the last question. <laughs> so um, uh, since, since this is the last lecture of uh, Pedro, I, I, I want everyone to turn on their cameras if they can and uh, the, uh, um, the microphones. So please, uh, so that uh, Pedro can see every, every one of you guys. And also- oh, Thank you. And also ask uh, for a big round of applause for Pedro's lecture. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your lecture. So, so you all exist. Uh, this, you all, I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure if you existed. This is great. This is great. I thought Rogério had just set up this um, bot with, with these screens just to pretend that people were there.